Welcome to Ask AI, the podcast that brings you insightful interviews and news from the world of Canadian artificial intelligence. This episode is sponsored by Microsoft Canada. Microsoft is committed to building trusted and responsible AI systems. To learn more, go to microsoft.com slash AI and check out their free AI business school to start building intelligence into your solutions today. We're also sponsored by Cinchi, the global leader in data fabric technology. Visit Cinchi.com to learn how to eliminate integration and turbocharge your AI transformation. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very exciting episode of the Ask AI podcast. I'm your host for today, Melissa Karjanakis, and today we'll be speaking with Matthew Reyes, co-founder and COO of Hypotenuse Labs. This is a little different than some of the other podcasts we've had in the past because Matthew at Hypotenuse Labs is a software consultancy that builds bleeding edge AI, web, and blockchain products for their clients. Super exciting. They're working on all sorts of blockchain open source projects, uh, working with metaverse startups, which is so hot right now, <laughs> and uh, a marketplace with corporate intelligence platform. Matthew is going to be sharing with us not just his journey with Hypotenuse, but his entire experience through AI as well. He'll be talking about how he wants to make AI more accessible for the future. He's a graduate from the University of Waterloo and has experience at companies like Uber, Snap, and even in banking and finance, which is fascinating. Outside of work, he's a professional musician and plays the drums for multiple bands in Toronto, as well as recording drums for artists all over the world. Very cool. Welcome, Matthew. Thank you, Melissa. My pleasure. Well, it's fantastic to have you here today, and I'm so excited for our listeners to hear about a different journey. And with that, maybe the best place for us to start is digging into what your journey was getting into AI. Like, how did you get into AI? Yeah, let me see. I would say my journey into AI was a bit of a non-traditional one. So if I go back as early as high school, I was actually going to go to music school. Um, and I had auditioned for music schools. And then eventually um, I did the 180 and decided I got an offer from the University of Waterloo to study math. I went there thinking I was going to study finance, financial math, and do, um, you know, eventually work at a trading firm or at a bank. Um, and then about halfway through, a lot of my peers were actually studying computer science and they were working in tech. And then I realized that a lot of the stuff I was doing in banking and finance um, overlapped with what they were doing. And so my journey to AI started when I decided that I want to explore the tech sector more. And that led me to, okay, well, what was the most overlap or what kind of was most related to what I already knew from my knowledge, um, you know, living in the spreadsheets, working in the banks. And it was actually data. And the more I studied on my own and started learning things like SQL, Python, I realized there's a ton of overlap between, you know, how I was thinking about data and for example, a spreadsheet and what my friends were doing over in Silicon Valley. And thankfully at Waterloo, we have the chance to work multiple co-ops. And that was kind of my chance to pivot and say, okay, I worked with some banking co-ops before I would like to try working in tech and start applying for those sorts of co-op jobs. And that's when I was discovered very quickly, there was this discipline called data science. And I just felt right at home. It was a lot of, a lot of the stuff I was doing in the banking world. And to me, it was super exciting getting to see it in a different context, you know, instead of doing it in finance, um, or, you know, analyzing things like trades. Now we're analyzing people's behavior on an app, or we're looking at, um, how do we make this service better or smarter? And these are apps that I would be using every day. So that was super exciting. And that's kind of how I ended up over there. What a journey um, from music school, potentially, and math and finance into computer science and data science specifically, and AI and, and behavioral analysis with data modeling. This is absolutely fascinating. I'm sure it will give some of our listeners with different backgrounds, different ideas about where their careers can go. I was chuckling when you were talking about spreadsheets. I, I had to mute myself so I wasn't laughing too hard on the track. <laughs> oh, no spreadsheets, right? <laughs> um, awesome. Well, one of the other things I'd love to start with is what you're focused on right now. So focused on your company, Hypotenuse, 
you know, when I go to your website, the first thing I see, and even in your bio are three big, frankly, buzzwords. You've got web, you've got AI, you've got blockchain. <laughs> so, okay, we know these buzzwords are hot right now, but what does that actually mean? That's a good point, Melissa. Those, those are the holy trinity of buzzwords right <laughs> now. Um, should probably include metaverse just to top it off, but <laughs> <laughs> nice. just to... Um, to exemplify this, maybe I can talk a bit about the kinds of things we build in each of those verticals. Because us as a consultancy, we have different practices within our team. And so on the website, we work a lot helping companies and startups build things like marketplaces, um, search engines, sometimes AI powered, sometimes you know just general search engines. And so that kind of covers the web vertical. Um, on the AI side, we've worked on a lot of really cool projects in the past. They've involved music tech, They've, we've worked with things like news article analysis, summarization, making it easier for editors to read an article quickly and write content about it. Um, and on the blockchain side, we've released a blog post recently talking about some really cool stuff we've done with the Algorand Foundation. TLDR of it is it's like a currency exchange within Algorand, allowing people to exchange one type of Algorand asset for another. And so as buzzwordy as these three may sound, we generally like to think of it as we're solving business problems. And oftentimes, um, a lot of our clients, just because of the folks we know, because we went to Waterloo, you know, we know a lot of folks in the blockchain space, because of our tech background, we've worked a ton with with web and um, with other, other folks who are in the AI space. And so we have a strong network and um, lots of friends in those places. And so that's kind of how we ended up in those three verticals. Fantastic. You've mentioned a couple things that I'd love to dive a little bit deeper on. First, the, the point about solving business challenges, the fact that you, yes, code things and use technology and, and AI, but you're solving business needs. Can you say a little bit more about that, please? Absolutely. I think starting out when we did this, we told ourselves, okay, we're engineers. We're going to go in and if people need something built, we will build it. And I think that was kind of a, um, a less mature way of thinking about consulting, um, especially at an early stage. You know, For us, we took a risk. We had just graduated. We had offers at all the tech companies sitting on the table. We could have done that, and we decided to do this instead. What we very quickly learned was that end of the day, what matters is that we are using software as a vehicle, whether it be specifically web and building web products or web apps or building some sort of AI system or engine or, you know, building something on the blockchain, whatever we're doing there, it's, it's to solve a business problem. And that was the most important thing. The more clients we work with, the more people um, we talked to. And as we kept doing this, we discovered end of the day, we're really business consultants and with our specialty being software. So oftentimes when they come to us, they have a problem in mind and it requires a lot of work and massaging to really understand the problem, understand the domain, understand the context, and then transforming that and translating that into software requirements or this thing needs to be built. And often the discussion is very heavy at the start where it's, you know, is this product worth building? Um, are these features really what's going to solve the problem? And that's where we discovered that's what consulting was really about. Amazing. And, and this is part of why we wanted to have you on the Ask AI podcast is that you really do come from a very different context than what we've seen before with both private sector companies focused on one particular product offering, or even public sector academics. I know we have a few of those episodes as well. So your positioning as a consulting firm, solving these business challenges, to use your words, using tech as, an a as a vehicle, is really, really fascinating. And of course, I, I come from a, a different context. <laughs> I come from the venture-backed startup world. And so, you know, you've bootstrapped this business and you're profitable, which blows my mind. So for those of us who aren't there, can you tell us, what is that like? <laughs> What's it like to be profitable? <laughs> to be honest, it's a lot of spreadsheet work. And it's, it's funny that I've gone full circle. Um, I spent a lot of time in spreadsheets doing cash flow analysis, you know, making sure that we're, we're able to, you know, pay competitive salaries, we're able to cover our expenses. I think what the mentality, and personally, I've never been in the startup position raising funding, but the mentality we've always approached it as is, okay, we need a budget, but we need to plan, you know, a few months ahead, at least a few months ahead and really understand our cash flow situation, really be able to forecast sales, ask ourselves, 
what can we be doing better when it comes to sales? Ever since day one, when we first started this, you know, we started it kind of as a joke, but then we slowly realized, wait, there's something here. We actually can help out other companies here in Toronto and even globally. And a lot of that kind of boils down to being able to manage cash flow and making sure that our team is happy. And I think that those things are the main things on our mind and how that differs possibly from other startups, which raise funding is that you have this big wad of cash that you're budgeting over for a longer period of time. Here, it's constantly asking ourselves, what are our sales looking like next month? What is our burn rate? If something goes wrong, do we have a war chest? And so that's all, of course, done in the spreadsheet. Amazing. I love it. Full circle back to the math, finance days, still in spreadsheets. Oh, my goodness. Those are some great lessons <laughs> talking about managing your cash flow, the sales component. I am also a very big believer in sales. So I would say I align with you on this because it's something that founders too often neglect. And there's so much emphasis on the tech. But if no one's buying what you're selling, it, it almost is a moot point, right? So I, I love those lessons learned. Is, are there any other nuggets of wisdom that you have from the profitability side that you wanted to share beyond the managing your cash flow, having that that foresight and the sales piece? Yeah. Um, just to talk a little bit more about sales on our end, you know, coming from a technical background, we actually were very not knowledgeable when it came to se selling sales, um, managing cash flow. I thankfully had taken a couple of accounting courses and my co-founder Calvin used to be in an accounting program before he switched into computer science. And on the sales side, we, we very quickly realized as a consultancy, our biggest value add was being able to have connections, whether it be knowing others, knowing others in the space who may need our help, or even knowing other engineers who might be able to help our clients that we can't help out um, or that we won't have capacity for. So I think a lot of this business does depend on relationships, which directly ties to our ability to sell. It directly ties to um, the kind of projects that come in. And so by extension, I, I also believe even for startups, it's the same kind of idea. It, definitely learn how to sell and learn learn how to help others and understand what they really need. Yeah, that that discovery of finding what the real problem is. That's fascinating. And on in that vein, it brings up this concept of build versus buy. When you have organizations who have a business need, who have a problem, and are they going to build it or are they going to acquire a company that already solves that that specific product need? And in your case, mm. obviously, you're on the build side, which is interesting. But specifically, there's the next level of is it an internal, are we going to build it question or an external are we going to hire someone to build it for us question? And obviously you fall within the build and externally. Can you talk to me a little bit more about to what extent you even have these conversations with your clients? Do they already know they need the help and have they already made the decision that they want you to help build something with them as an external agency? Like, is that decision typically already made by the time you're in touch or is, do you have any engagement in that process of build versus buy and then, you know, building internally versus externally? That's a really good question. And honestly, it depends. In the earlier days, we found ourselves with some projects that were very much like we augment other teams. Like we may may have some expertise in AI and the, the team we're working with, they're really good at blockchain or they're really good at web. And then, you know, our skill sets complement each other. And when it comes to the, the products, whether it's building it internally or building it externally or even not building it and just buying it, it's definitely down to the cost analysis on both ends. And when we work with our clients, we always want to talk through this with them and really understand, okay, well, you know, a lot of our clients, for example, they don't have capacity to build X and Y and their investors or the customers really need this feature done or really need this improvement made. Well, if they were due in house, you have to train someone, you have to first, even before that, you have to hire someone. You have to go through that whole vetting process. And if your team doesn't specialize in something like AI, it may be harder to vet for AI skill sets that are relevant. And then after that, you have to train them, onboard them, and then you have to spec it out and then start building internally. And a lot of our clients being startups, they don't have that much time to do these things. And then that's often when we get the call. <laughs> I love it. It sounds like a Batman or something. We get the call. We come, <laughs> we come into action. <laughs> Software, SWAT Software SWAT team, team maybe. <laughs> I love that. Hey, it makes sense, right? You know, accountants turning into Marvel heroes and you have 
uh, accountant backgrounds. And now look, you can be the heroes of the startup world. I love that. We'll ask two more questions related to technology and your journey and your company and things like that. And then I want to get more into some of the personal elements because we're about halfway through now. So the last couple questions here on, you know, professional elements, you've had stints at companies like Uber, like Snap. You mentioned at the beginning that you and your two other co-founders had offers like all computer science grads tend to have. And yet you chose to build this company and build it in Toronto. Tell me more about that decision. Why stay domestically in Canada? We know the tech scene is, is quote unquote hot in Toronto, but you also had the access in some of the other globally competitive mar markets like LA, like San Francisco. Talk to me about why you picked Toronto. Yeah, it was a tough decision and it it took a while to really settle with it. But when my co-founders and I decided to start this, we actually had a lot of family here, um, a lot of friends here. And, you know, living in Toronto, we were, we kind of saw that there's how they do in Silicon Valley. And then this is how things are done in Toronto. And we saw that there is potential here because in Toronto, it looked to us that, you know, this is really fledgling. There's a, there's a tech scene here. It's coming a long way and it's really growing. And we want to be a part of that. We, we felt that in Silicon Valley, there's so much talent there and that there's almost like a brain drain happening. Like all my friends are in the States. <laughs> Maybe a few of them are still in Canada, but almost all of them after we graduated went over. And what we were seeing was like, it was Toronto was kind of getting underserved. A lot of the best were leaving. They were going to the States and they were working over there. All my friends did at least. And so anecdotally speaking, it to us, it was, it was like, well, well, in Toronto, could we really build something here? You know, us being a remote company, yes, we can have US clients, but there's a lot of potential here in Toronto. We could we could help our companies here. There's there's skill sets we've learned from the valley and there's there's ways of doing things and kind of the approach of just iterating really fast and and building rapidly that I think Toronto could benefit from. And that that sort of Silicon Valley attitude bringing that to, to Toronto was I guess something we've wanted to try it out or we've always wanted to try out. Interesting. And that and that leads to my follow-up here around how things are done stateside and how things are done in Toronto. You mentioned, you know, how things are done here in Toronto. And one of the, the differences you mentioned was the speedy iteration, the rapid prototyping, putting things out to market very quickly from the Bay Area, the Silicon Valley mentality. And certainly in my travels, I've seen that as well. What would you say are the mm -hmm. top two maybe three, but top two defining factors of how things are done in Toronto that may be different from the Bay Area? That's a good question. I would say the risk appetite between the two regions is very different. And as a result, that influences what investors are looking for or how investments are being done. So just from what we've seen, We've noticed that in Toronto, folks can be a lot more risk adverse, and oftentimes they wait till profitability or strong promise of profitability before investing. Versus in the states, where what we've seen is that people are a lot more risk taking, more risk hungry. They're willing to go out on a limb and try something out. And I think that difference in attitude, where it's like figure out the profitability later, versus is this a sustainable business that's going to really grow? I think that's what we've seen defines the differing attitudes between the two regions. And in Toronto, it's interesting because the founders here are also, at least in our experience, a lot of them are older folks. They're, they've, they're more experienced. And a lot of the founders we work with in the States, they're, they may still be in college or they may still be, you know, this is after their first job, after graduation, then they started a startup or maybe they went straight to a startup. And the types of founders in the two regions we find hmm. are very different. That's fascinating. So the two key differences between the Bay Area and Toronto being the risk aversion, particularly around investment, and the different types of founders. I, I would agree. I would agree. I, I think that's great. So moving forward into some of your personal life, I think it's so neat that you're a musician. I'm a musician as well. A little bit more classical with the opera thing. No way. But like, tell me more about the drums and music and what it's like to, in a sense, almost have two careers. Oh man. I think with music that came way before, um, even studying math, 
at Waterloo. Like I had been doing that for a lot of my life. And for me, my introdu introduction to music, as well as many of my peers, it was piano lessons. And eventually that evolved into, you know, I was a huge gamer as a kid. I played a ton of video games. I loved the soundtracks and I would learn soundtracks on the piano. And then eventually I saw the Blue Man Group when they were in Toronto. My parents took me to, and my brothers to watch them. And then they were playing all these crazy types of drums. And then from there, I had this moment where I said, I want to play drums. And, you know, in parallel with school, I was focused on academics pretty heavily growing up. I would take lessons with a lot of different teachers. And I got a lot of encouragement, even from my high school, where, you know, you should consider music as a career. You're, you're you know, you're really hardworking. Um, you, you really love doing this. And I just naturally fell into it as a passion as I kept doing it. I got that really good feedback loop doing it. And then I think what I noticed as I was, especially towards the end of high school and going into university, even though I had decided not to pursue music post-secondary, the, the mentality and the learning process is actually quite similar to what I was experiencing in my first years at Waterloo studying math. I'm not sure if they're the same side of the brain or if it's more so just the approach of being very, very patient and letting things marinate in your mind. But that's, that actually made me love music even more. And I don't know if there's any better feeling than being up on stage with people that you've practiced a bunch with and just sharing that music with others and that experience with others. And so I always kept that going as I was in university and to this day. And naturally started to pursue it more seriously as more opportunities would come up. My peers and I would get better at music. And yeah, it does feel like two jobs sometimes, <laughs> but I regret nothing. Absolutely. <laughs> I love it. No, it's it's true. There's there's I agree, there's nothing more special in life than sharing music with other people. I, especially with all the work that goes into it before you even get to the performance. And people don't realize it's it's not just even practicing that particular thing. It's the years and years like you talked about starting with piano, learning the songs you're hearing on video games, then deciding to get into drums. And and it's a journey. It's a lifelong journey that brings you to that moment on that stage, sharing your music with others. So pretty incredible. Thank you so much, Matthew. I want to make sure that we ask one key question that we ask every single guest on this podcast. And thinking beyond hypotenuse and certainly beyond drumming, because <laughs> we're swinging back to AI, <laughs> I would love to hear in the vein of thinking about the future of AI and what's to come, what's exciting you right now? That's a good question. I think what excites me the most is just how close to reality we are getting in when it comes to simulating or mimicking it. And that's also something that scares me a bit. But, you know, having worked with GPT-3 and, you know, really cutting edge models and just seeing all the breakthroughs that are happening so rapidly right now, What's really exciting is just how, how close to reality we can simulate. And, you know, for example, you'd see examples online of GPT-3. It generates very realistic looking content that you can't discern from a human. What does that mean for the future? Are we going to be in a future where everything needs to be verified and signed that this was made by a human versus a machine? Um, when, we, when people make creative arts, any sort of creative medium, and they're using AI as a tool to help them, which, you know, that's something that's happening right now, too. How are we going to give credit to these models and the people who build them? And there's just so many open questions coming up now that the technology has gotten so much better. Um, it almost feels like we're entering a cyberpunk era. And I think that's what's really exciting to me. That's very cool. I like it. The cyberpunk future and a, a neat take on making sure we give credit to the people who built these models if, in fact, artists are, are leveraging them in their work. Super, super neat. All right. Well, with that, we're down to our last couple of minutes. Is there any burning thing that I didn't ask you? Any really critical detail you want to make sure that you share with our listeners? No, I think um, nothing to add on my end. Um, this was really fun. I, I will say if, if um, any of you folks who are listening are interested in learning more about the things that we're working on here at Hypotenuse Labs, don't hesitate to reach out directly. And my email is at hello at hypotenuse.ca and more than happy to talk AI blockchain, uh, what it's like in a consultancy, and so on, or even music. Very nice. Well, thank you again so very much for your time, Matthew. As always, we want to thank our generous sponsors, Microsoft Canada, Cinchi, and of course, make sure you tech, check out our team check-ins, which are another great way to get involved with the Ask AI podcast. You can get more details at 
askai.org. We invite our listeners to send us any questions and feedback to info at askai.org. Thanks so much for being with me today, Matthew. Tons of fun and congratulations on everything so far. Truly, truly congratulations on your journey and good luck for the future. Thank you so much, Melissa. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Ask AI podcast. The sponsors of this episode were Microsoft Canada, producers of the free AI business school, and Cinchi, the dataware platform that makes integration obsolete. The series producer was Chris McClellan. The series editor was James Fajardo. Original music was provided by Mike Letourneau. To learn how to be featured on our podcast and get information about sponsorship and volunteering opportunities, please visit our website at askai.org, send us an email to info at askai.org, or talk to our bot by visiting askai.org forward stroke chatbot.